great conversations last night with some of you and look forward to getting to know others here throughout the day, the evening. Hopefully you're just uh, here blessed, getting a little rest from work and uh, getting challenged from God's word and being encouraged just as a man to be faithful. The thing for the camp is a, a man that honors God. So we want to honor God with our time. This morning we're going to talk about honoring God in our marriage. And I know that not all of you are married. In fact, you're here this morning. You're not married. Raise your hand for me. You're here. You're not married. So you guys are all sitting on this side. All of you are here. Okay, I see where you're at. All right. Awesome. Well, hopefully you'll still find some of these truths will apply to you as you prepare to maybe be married one day. And that's what the Lord has for you. And uh, I thought I would just kind of start off telling you just a little bit about how I met my wife. Uh, Rick was there. Uh, Rich was there. Uh, I came to seminary single, so I was 26 years old, resigned from my job as a physician's assistant, moved to Los Angeles, and uh, pretty much about halfway through seminary, Rich kept trying to introduce me to all these girls in his Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'm not joking about that. <laughs> there was this one young girl, she wasn't in Rich's Bible study. But she's part of our college ministry, and I kind of taken a notice that this girl was beautiful. And in our college ministry of almost a thousand students, she was just she was just like a cut above, you know. She would just kind of levitate through the room. She was like had angel wings on her back. And I was kind of like, who is this girl? So finally, at this social event that our pastor Rick Collin had um, had uh, an annual event, we called it dinner and a movie. And so the goal of this event was for us to uh, come together and make a funny video and then have dinner together and watch all these different videos from the different Bible studies and just have a fun social event. And Rick would always say, this is a great place for you to bring a date. So I was a Bible study leader. We call them shepherds at CSUN, Cal State at Northridge. And so our whole Bible study just came as friends. There was no one dating in our studies. So we just kind of all came as friends. And so we came and sat at this table and we're watching all these funny videos and we're having dinner and it's a nice night. And about halfway through, they have an intermission. And I go and talk to one of my other uh, seminary buddies. His name is Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah Maine. So I go over to Jeremiah. I'm like, hey man, how are you doing? He's like, I'm doing awesome. And he asked me, he said, did you bring a date? And I said, no, man, I'm just here with our Bible study. We're just all kind of hanging out. I said, how about you? Did you bring a date? And he's like, yeah, I did. I said, who did you bring? He said, I brought Lisa Seahusen. And I said, who's that? I knew this girl's name was Lisa, but I didn't know her last name. So when he said Seahusen, I wasn't even thinking about this girl I kind of had taken an interest to. And he's like, oh, if you saw her, you would know exactly who that is. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> so about this time, the, the light's down. I go sit back at my table. He's going back to his table, presumably sitting next to his date. You know, so I'm like walking back and kind of looking to see who he's sitting by. And I'm like, oh, man, that's that girl I was going to ask out. <laughs> you snooze, you lose. <laughs> Goodness, why, why didn't I think of that? I should have gone for it. So the event ended. And I walk right back up to my friend Jeremiah, and I'm like, hey, Jeremiah, it's good to see you again. And then I look at Lisa, and I'm like, well, hello. <laughs> I'm like, what's your name? And she's like, I'm Lisa, see you soon. I'm like, you are. Okay, so I'm like, trying to talk to you a little bit, and then God's providence, son of God, comes over to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, I have a deep theological question. <laughs> talk to this guy, and I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I still think you put him up to it, actually. So Jeremiah's talking to this guy, I'm talking to Lisa, I'm like, hey, so you're, you're at Master's, you know, where are you from? And we're just started talking, and it was like, it was like a really fun conversation, and I felt, started feeling bad, because we're like, we're like, like, it's like something's happened, you know, there's like a little, a few chemistry, you know, bells and whistles going off as I'm talking to this girl. She was being really sweet. I'm just trying to get to know her a little bit. But I'm like moving in on my guy's date. <laughs> what am I doing? I didn't think about that. So Jeremiah comes back out and I'm like, hey, you guys have a good night. Jeremiah, good to see you again. Lisa, call me. <laughs> church. I'm like cleaning up. It's like late at night, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, cleaning the gym. I'm sweeping the floor. There's like one light on at the top of the gym. It's dark. I'm like, Lord, why come all the other guys get the girls? You know, I'm just here, I'm just here to serve you, Lord. <laughs> cleaning up, and I'm thinking like, man, I should have I jumped on that. Now I might have missed that, that, that one, you know? 
So the next day, church comes around, and I'm looking for Lisa, and I can't find her anywhere. Now, granted, there's like a thousand people in the college ministry and more than that in the church, but I can't find her. So I go up to the secretary who I knew knew her because they were in the same Bible study. Her name was Karen Medina. So I go up to Karen. I say, hey, Karen, you know uh, this girl Lisa? She's like, yeah. I'm like, where's she at? Where's she at? And she said, oh, she had a, a race that she was running this morning. She doesn't usually do this, but she's a runner. I'm a runner. And, uh, and she was like, running? I'm like, oh, okay. And, and she's like, why are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I was just looking for her. I talked to her a little bit last night. And I'm like, and I'm like but she was there with Jeremiah. Karen looks at me and she said, oh, she don't like Jeremiah. <laughs> I said, how do you know? She's like, I'm a girl. Trust me. I know. <laughs> I said, what do you think? And Karen said to me, I think she's got Georgia on her mind. What's happening? The next day I go to work. I was working as a PA at this time in family practice in Thousand Oaks, and I was over of Santa Clarita, I mean uh, Los Angeles, uh, about 45 minutes to an hour from Santa Clarita. So these girls at the office where I work were always trying to set me up with their unbelieving friends. You know, I'm, I'm the PA, at this point I'm 28, single, eligible bachelor, so they're trying to set me up with all these girls, but they're not believers. So I'm always like, no, no, not interested, thank you. They're starting to worry about it, you know. So, <laughs> so I get to work on that Monday morning, and um, I said, they asked me, they're like, well, how did your little social go at church? And then they're talking about you know, what we were doing that weekend, the Friday before. And I said, hey, I, the thing went great. I think I met somebody. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I'll talk to this girl. I'm thinking about, you know, like maybe trying to move in on that. And, then, and, I, and I'm like, but I, so they were all excited. And I said, but I can't. And they're like, why not? And I said, well, she was there with a friend of mine. And they were like, oh, it don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> if she ain't got no ring, it ain't no thing. <laughs> so I'm like thinking about these girls are like, you gotta ask her out. I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do that. You know, I'm, I'm a loyalist to my buddies, right? So I'm like driving home from work that day, and I'm thinking about it. I'm like, should I call her? Should I not? Should I call her? Should I not? I'm really wrestling with this. And so guess what I did? Oh, Jeremiah. That's a good question. <laughs> Or babes, which one? Buds over babes, babes over buds. What do I do with this? So I call her Bible study leader. His name was Brad Pixley. That's my name, Brad. Uh, so I call Brad. That's the Bible study. She went to him like, Brad, I gotta ask you a question. There's this girl. He says like, Oh yeah, she's awesome. And I'm like, Brad's like an older guy. He's married. And, and I'm like, well, What do you know about her? He's like, She loves the Lord. She just returned on a mission trip to Uganda. I had been on a mission trip to Uganda. I'm like, we're just lining all this stuff up, you know? And he's like, he's like, uh, she disciples girls in our group. She's filled with joy. She's she's a godly girl. You should you should ask her out. And I said, yeah, but she was there with Jeremiah. And he's like, look, I'm just telling you, this girl is like, you know, she's top picking. So I said, well, do you mind if I get her number from you? And I'll think about it, you know. So I get her number, and I keep going, uh, you know, driving home. Like I just can't do it. So I, did, I didn't I, I didn't call her. Next morning, it's now Tuesday morning, we have an early meeting with Rick Holland again, our college pastor, at 6 a.m. in the morning. Rich was there, Rick was there, and Jeremiah was there. He was another, you know, young ministry guy. So I walk up to Jeremiah before our meeting kicked off early Tuesday morning, and I said, hey, Jeremiah, uh, how you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm like, hey, did you, did you have a good time on Saturday night? He's like, man, I had a great time. <laughs> and I'm like, so are you going to ask her out again? He's like, no. I said, well, why not? You had a great time. Why wouldn't you ask her out again? He said, oh, well, you know, we had a good time, but I don't think she's interested in dating anybody right now. And she just told me she just wanted to be friends. She wasn't. <laughs> she's not in that stage of life, you know, where she's interested in dating anybody. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I put my arm around it, and I'm like, dude, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I said, you, you mind if I ask her out? And he said, what? Said, you just told me you're not going to ask her out again. Do you mind if I ask her out? He's like, yeah, go for it. Like, she's not interested in guys dating, marriage right now. She's just focused on whatever. So yeah, well, sure, go for it. I'm like, okay, I'm in. So now I got permission. <laughs> so that night, that night I'm studying Hebrew with Dr. Barrett, a Hebrew professor. And I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm like, I gotta call her. So right in the middle of my study session, I call Lisa, 
and it just goes straight to her voicemail. She's like, hey, this is Lisa, I leave a message. And I said, may I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom which I have been crucified to the world and the world to me. Galatians 6.14. Like, come on, guys, that's in seminary. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, Lisa, this is Adam. I just want to encourage you in the word tonight. Hope you appreciate it. <laughs> 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 Hope you're doing good. It was great talking to you a little bit on Saturday. And uh, I'd love to, you know, like touch base some point. If you want to call me back, here's my number. If not, maybe I'll see you next Sunday. Have a nice night. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so I hang up and I'm like, it's pretty good. I was giving myself a score. It's like a seven. <laughs> I encouraged her in the word, you know, <laughs> gave her my number, she wants to call back, she can't, and then my mind started messing with me, because I'm from the south, right, I'm from Georgia, where my mom said, girls don't call guys on the phone, you call them, they don't call you, so I started thinking, like, well, should she call me back, like, would a godly girl, a master's <laughs> call me back on the phone, and like, and I did initiate, you know, and I'm like, if she really likes me, she'll call me back, if she doesn't like me, I'll never hear from her again, so I'm just, like, wrestling with this, like, is she going to call, is she not going to call, so it's like looking at my watch, you know, it's like, it's like 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.15. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's not calling. It's like, it's getting late on a Tuesday night. I'm like, let me get back to Hebrew. I got a quiz tomorrow. I got to get back in my Hebrew. And like 10.17, she calls. And this is back in, you know, early 2000s where when you called somebody, you didn't know if you're calling like the landline or the cell phone. Sometimes you just didn't know what you're calling. But I had her name already programmed in that cell phone. So I just see her calling back and it's like, Lisa C. Houston. I'm like, I'm like yes. But I didn't want her to know that I knew who it was. So I answered the phone and I'm like, hello. <laughs> She's like, is Adam there? And I'm like, speaking. <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh, I was just kind of, you know, calling you back. I'm like, what are you doing calling so late? I'm like, it's after 10 o'clock. I'm trying to study. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to know, guys. Come on. I didn't want to know. I was like, like, off the charts, excited about her call. So I'm like, I'm trying to study. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, it's okay, girl. What's up? <laughs> so we start talking again, and we're like connecting and picked out right where we left off the Saturday night before. And I'm like, this is going really well. And then all of a sudden, uh, Rick Holland calls in. It's like 10.30, Rick calls in. I'm like, Lisa, I don't, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've been playing phone tag with Rick all day about something. I kind of take this call. She's like, okay, tell Rick I said hello. And I said, well, how do you know Rick? You know, and she's like, well, just tell him I said hello. I'm like, okay. So I click back over to Rick, and he's like, what was that? I'm like, I was just with somebody else on the phone. He's like, who? I'm like, I'm talking to Lisa Seahusen. He said, what are you doing talking to her? I said, Rick. I'm trying to make myself available to young women in our ministry who have needs. <laughs> so what Lisa needs is a godly husband. Because <laughs> Rick's like always trying to put people together. So I'm like, honey, do you know this girl? And he's like, yeah, I officiated her sister's wedding. I was a, the youth pastor at her church. She was originally from Detroit. Rick had spent like two years as a youth pastor in Detroit, knew the family, knew all of her siblings. He's like, this is a great girl. you got to call her back, man. He's like, hey, he's like you know, here's what we need to talk about. You just definitely need to pursue this. So I pursued it, and it went awesome. Here we are 20 years later, five kids. And if you stick around for the tonight session, I'll tell you a little bit more about our first argument. <laughs> our first argument. But for now, we're getting into our session, right? We're talking about living with your wife in an understanding way. And you see the passage that we're looking at this morning is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Let me pray for us and we'll just jump right into our time together. I'll read the verse and then let's pray. It says, likewise, or if you have an NASB in the same way, or likewise, ESV, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. 
God, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to gather together to sing songs of worship and praise, to open up a familiar passage of scripture to probably all of us here in this room, certainly to us who are, who are married. And I pray that you would help us to take to heart the principles, the context, the, the words here uh, from the scripture that would really challenge us and encourage us to know and live with our lives in an understanding way. God, be glorified in our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Women are beautiful <coughs> creatures, but sometimes they can be a little hard to understand. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> He was walking along the beach here in Virginia, called Virginia Beach. He stumbled upon a bottle that washed up from the ocean. And he rubbed the bottle, and lo and behold, a genie pops out and offers him three wishes. The man said to the genie, you're not going to believe this, but I recently, so this is the man talking to the genie, he says, I already recently won a week's vacation at an all-inclusive resort in the Bahamas for me and the family. The only catch is... I've got to be there by next week, but when I tried to book an airline ticket for our family, uh, the airlines were sold out. So the genie replied, you know, so he wants to buy his first uh, request for their wishes, can I get airline uh, tickets to the Bahamas? And the genie replied, well, there's no way I can do that, because in granting a wish for you, I can't change the plans of other people. If the airlines are sold out, I can't push somebody off that flight to get you on, so I can't do that. So the guy goes to his second witch, and he's like, well, is there any way uh, you could just build a bridge, a road, all the way from Virginia Beach out to the Atlantic, straight down to the Bahamas? Is there any way that you could uh, build a bridge? And we'll just drive to the Bahamas for our all-inclusive vacation. And the genie says, well, there's no way I can do that either. I mean, can you think of all the footings and all the pilings to build a bridge that would be that long all the way to the Bahamas from Virginia Beach, and so, man, the guy's already used up two wishes, so he gets to his third wish, and he says, well, listen, on a different note, I've been having a really hard time understanding my wife lately. I want to know what she's thinking, and I want to know what makes her tick, and I haven't been doing a good job at that, and I could really use some help. The genie thought about it for a minute, and looked at him, and he said, how many lanes do you want? <laughs> <laughs> some books that have helped me greatly on this. One is called The Exemplary Husband by Dr. Stuart Scott. My other favorite book would have to be Lou Priolo and The Complete Husband. These are classics when it comes to godly, uh, being a godly husband. But in The Complete Husband, uh, Lou Priolo writes a chapter there. The first chapter in that book is entitled, I Wish She Came with an Owner's Manual. <laughs> Listen to what it says. This is from Lou Priolo. It says, your car came from one. So did your television, your stereo, your camera, and your computer. It's too bad your wife didn't come with an owner's manual as well. Imagine how easy it would be to live with her if she came with a set of instructions, a book in which you could find out everything you needed to know in order to keep her healthy, happy, and humming at optimum capacity. If you had a manual of this kind, it would provide you with current information about your woman in general, and it would also furnish you with valuable data and specific product information about your wife in particular. Proper maintenance instructions, directions how to read her various emotional meters and gauges, <laughs> cleansing instructions, various warnings and hazards, and even a comprehensive section on how to troubleshoot when difficulties <laughs> arise. But alas, he writes, your wife is a woman, and women don't come with owner's manuals, or do this. And then Priola writes this, quote, allow me to let you in on a little known secret. Your wife does come with an owner's manual. The reason you've never seen it is because it's tucked away in her heart. Down deep in her heart is all the personal information you need to understand and nurture your wife according to the Bible. There's just one catch. You're the one who's supposed to get it out of her. That's right, it's your job to get that valuable information out of her heart. I remember reading that as a young married guy, I'm like, man, that's just so profound, isn't it? That everything I really need to know about my wife, I could say subjectively, would be down in her heart, 
objectively it would be found in the Bible, which is a manual of how we live life. And so we have this subjectivity of having conversations to draw out what our wife is thinking, what she's feeling, what emotions she might be experiencing. And then we have the Bible that objectively tells us how we can live with our wives in an understanding way. I mean, Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Are you a man of understanding? Are you seeking to understand your wife? Do you complain more about not understanding your wife, or are you really working hard to dig deep to apply what this verse is about, to live with your wife in an understanding way? You say, but Adam, women are just so different. And I would respond to that, brilliant. You are brilliant. If you think that women are different, they are. And I'm so thankful for those differences, right? God created us to be completely different. And in a culture where men are being stripped of their masculinity and women are being separated from their femininity, it's refreshing to remember that men and women are different and that's created that way by design, right? Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Well, you couldn't do that if we weren't different. We're different biologically, right? We're different emotionally, and in a time that is trying to push for a gender-neutral society, a unisex culture, a pseudo-hermaphroditic age, let's acknowledge that biblical manhood and womanhood is ordained by God. And I know that here at Grace Bible Church, you hold to a complementarian view of gender roles. Complementarianism teaches that men and women are created equal before God in our value and in our dignity, but we have different roles and responsibilities both at home and at church. So we're equal, but we're different, right? And so here in this passage, in 1 Peter 3, really verses 1 through 7, Paul describes some of those, or Peter, excuse me, describes those differences in the rules of a wife and a husband who want to live their lives to the glory of God while being in marriage, to be even a Christian witness to the world. And so let's turn our attention to what the Bible has to say about living with your wife in an understanding way. And here's the truth. If you want to lead your wife well and be a faithful husband, you need to understand her better. And so I want us to just look at this one verse this morning. God knew we couldn't handle more than one verse. So this is one verse, but it is loaded with truth that will help us in this area. I want to give you three headings from verse 7 that will help capture the essence of how you can lead your wife and live with her in an understanding way. Here we go. Number one, you must submit to God by being considerate of your wife. You must submit to God by being considerate of your wife. First Peter, it's a book that's all about broadcasting the glory of God in the lives of believers, living out our testimony in such a way that it would demonstrate we're submitted to Him in all of life. And in First Peter, there's a lot of suffering. We're talking about Nero. We're talking about Rome. We're talking about the church starting to face persecution. So it's a lot about suffering, how to suffer well. First Peter's a lot about submitting. Submitting to those authorities over us. First Peter is also about humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. And so when we get to chapter 3, verse 1, when it says in the same way, if you have an NASB or likewise in the ESB, I just want to say that God's not just picking on women here, saying they need to be subject to their husbands, as if all of a sudden God's just like, I'm going to tell women to submit to men. It's not really just thrown out like that. It's in the context of the theme of First Peter, which is all about submitting to those over you. In fact, in First Peter, there are four clear areas where Christians must submit to those in authority over them to the glory of God. Submission is found number one. So we're talking about, you know, you must submit to God. So I'm saying there in A, submission is for husbands too. Let me clarify what I mean by that. Number one, citizens must submit to the government. Citizens must submit to the government. If you back up to chapter 2 and you look at verses 13 and following, it just simply says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And so he goes into this conversation about, Look, you've got to submit to your government. We think it's bad enough to have to submit to our 
political system. Well, Nero is even worse than our present political system is today. And yet God still called the church to submit to the government, to those who were in charge. Citizens were expected as godly men and women to submit to the government. Number two, Peter also teaches about how servants must submit to their masters. So not only are citizens submitting to the government, but servants must submit to their masters. Look at chapter 2, verse 18, where it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And so it goes on to unpack, to say, hey, you, you got to submit no matter what. If, you're, if your boss is good, that's easy. But if your boss is no good, you still submit, because in submitting, you're going to broadcast the glory of God by submitting to those in authority over you. And then number three is verse one of chapter three, wives must submit to their husbands. So it's in that context that we then see likewise or in the same way, wives be subject to your own husbands. So we're equal in our value and dignity that we have different roles and responsibilities and the wife is called to be the helpmate and the wife is called to be the one that would submit to the husband and respect him as Ephesians 5 talks about. And then we build, building on that theme, we get to number four in your outline, husbands must submit to who? To God. So when I say husbands must submit to, I'm not talking about mutual submission in an egalitarian sense. I'm just saying you're under authority as well. Because in each one of these situations, ultimately the government is under God's authority. The boss, the master is under God's authority. The wife is under God's authority, under the husband, right? And then the husband's under God's authority. And that's why I'm taking that from the first word in verse 7, which says likewise. So he's building a case. He's like, hey, don't forget about this whole authority submission thing. So even though you're the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, you're still submitting to God. You still submit to him. And by the, by the way, even though Christ is the head of the church, he still submitted to his Father's will. Did he not? The Gospel of John is all about that. I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the will of the Father. And in fact, in the same context... Chapter 2, verse 21, shows us that, how Jesus was more than willing to submit to the Father's will in 2.21. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. And it goes on to talk about how, even though he didn't commit any sin, there was no deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. But when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. You could say from that whole context, as well as verses 24 and 25, that Jesus submitted to the Father's will by going to the cross. So even though he's the head of the church, he still demonstrated humility and submission. And we're supposed to be following his example. In order to be Christ-like in our marriages, wives should be submitting to their husbands, as uh, verses 1 through 6 talk about. But now we're in verse 7, that husbands are to submit to God. Likewise, in the same way, husbands are to keep that in mind. We're to keep in mind that just as Christ submitted, so must we submit. And then in verse 7, it talks about how husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way. That, that word live means to cohabitate with. It, it means literally to dwell with. It, it's describing how to conduct oneself when living with your wife. You're to live with her in an understanding way, in accordance with knowledge. This would certainly include the idea of being considerate. How do you be considerate to anybody? Well, by, by knowing them. In order to be considerate, you have to know them as a person. What would, what would they appreciate? That's true of all people in general, but considerate... Uh, you know, understanding of a husband with a wife is particularly being addressed here. Not just in some general social etiquette way, but on an intimate way in a marriage. In fact, the word here, when it says look with her in an understanding way, the word, the word that's being spelled out here is the word gnosis, the word knowledge. It literally means live with her in accordance with knowledge. In other words, a husband is to really live with his wife in an understanding and considerate way. And in order to do that, he's got to really, he's got to know her. He's got to really know who she is. And, and that's what we're talking about. As you look at your next blank, it just simply says you need to understand your wife. And I'm saying to you, you've got to really know her. Really, really know her. So here's just a couple of practical ways to really know the woman that you're married to. Number one, you need to know some key memories from your wife's past. You need to know some key memories from your wife's past. Now, I already told you I'm an ACBC certified counselor. I don't buy into psychology at all. But I'm just saying common sense also says it'd be nice for you to know a little bit about your wife's upbringing. 
kind of what made her tick and kind of what, 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 what are some of her experiences in her life. And in and, and, and doing that, you're asking a lot of questions and you're learning more about what, what, what her interests may be. And in doing that, that's going to help you be more considerate about how can I really know her to know how I can best minister to her today. Like, for example, my wife, after we got married, um, I went to her parents' home. They were living in Dallas at the time. They moved from Michigan to Dallas. And so we were hanging out over the holidays, and her mom made a big spread. And uh, we asked the blessing. Her dad asked the blessing. And I'm like, man, let's eat. So I picked up my fork, start digging in. I'm like, oh, this is so good. And I start looking around the table, and no one else is eating. So I'm like, oh, okay. well, we, we prayed. Yeah, we prayed. And I'm like, what's, what's the deal? Well, well the, the mom was still like putting a few more things on the table. And etiquette in her home was nobody lifts a fork until the matriarch lifts her fork. If you lift that fork before she lifts her fork, you're dishonoring her, which I had just done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's keeping me under the table. Like, oh, we pray. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, you know, so I, I needed to learn that. You know, so at our table, my kids, don't lift your fork until so mama lifts her fork. I mean, we don't do that anymore, but I tried it for a while. <laughs> This is family grew up in Michigan, going to the orchard, uh, apple orchard every fall. Mine didn't. We didn't do that. Right? Lisa's family ate Chinese food every Christmas Eve. That was just their thing. So I was trying to wonder how early in our marriage, she's like, we got to do Chinese food. I'm like, Chinese food is like Christmas. So that's what you do. You do Chinese food on Christmas Eve. She grew up like that. I should have learned that one real quick. Uh, Lisa would celebrate uh, Jesus' birthday on Sunday night. They have a whole thing they do about singing happy birthday to Jesus and a cake. And there's props that you use for the kids. It's a really sweet thing. Uh, so I'm just saying just learning about that can help. Like Instead of being like, why are we doing this? You know, like, oh, this is part of your life. This is part of how you grew up. This is just part of things that are meaningful to you. Th those are just normal ways to be sweet. And for some reason, it's when you're dating that you're interested in all those things. And after you get married, you're like, who cares? You know, Virginia Tech's playing this afternoon. That's all that matters. I'm still working with Rich about that. So you must bring that. No, but, I, no, but I'm just saying that, that we've got to keep asking questions. Your wife, you will never know all about your wife in 50 years of marriage, right? It's constantly getting to know her and learning about things about her. It's just a, a way to be kind and considerate and understanding. And not only to understand her some of her things in the past, but number two, you need to know the desires of your wife in the present. It would be wise for you to know in the present, right, what's going on. Now let's say you and I are buddies, you know, we're guys, and let's say it's my birthday, and some guy from my church, you know, is like, oh, pastor, you know, happy birthday, I got you something. You know, first of all, I'd be like, it's kind of weird because guys don't buy guys gifts. <laughs> okay. And I open it up, and it's like, a, it's like a $20 gift card to Walmart. What do you think I want to think about that? Some guy from the church gives me 20 bucks to Walmart. I'm like, oh, dude, thanks. That's awesome. You know, I'll go get a football. You know, I'll go buy something at Walmart. No big deal. But let's say that it's your wife's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to get her a twenty dollar gift card to Walmart. And you're like, hey honey, happy birthday, I got you something. Oh honey, that's so sweet. And she's thinking she's gonna get like this big two hundred dollar gift certificate to the spa. Right? And she opens it up and it's twenty bucks to Walmart. <laughs> What's she gonna do? <laughs> yeah, after she slaps, she's silly. This is what Aaron does to Rick. <laughs> After she slaps you, she's going to say, don't you even know me? 20 bucks to Walmart? Are you serious? Is this a joke? You know, okay, she might not quite say it like that if she's super godly, but that's what she's going to be thinking, right? Like, do you even know me? Right? If you really know your wife, you know that that's not what you're going to get her on her birthday. That's just not what you do, right? It's understanding what would be honoring to her. I like how Wayne Grudem writes on this verse, the knowledge Peter intended here may include any knowledge that would be beneficial to the husband-wife relationship, knowledge of God's purposes and principles for marriage, knowledge of the wife's desires, goals, and frustrations, knowledge of her strengths and weaknesses in the physical, emotional, and spiritual realms. Right, so it goes a lot further than just knowing what kind of gift do I get her, but where are her strengths and weaknesses in the Lord? Where, where is she strong in Christ? That's what drew me to her. Where are some areas that I can help her shore up her dependence on the Lord? A husband would do well to know his wife's preferences on a number of fronts and to prefer them over his own. 
And so how are you doing in that area? Do you know what your wife's favorite flower is? Do you know the cup of coffee that she would order? Do you know around the house just simple things like if company was coming over, would she rather you, you know, go get the yard straightened out or, or help clean the family room? It's the family room, by the way. It's always the family room, right? Uh, you know, do you know how you could, you know, live with her in an understanding way? I mean, God wants us to live with her, to know her, and God wants us in that knowledge to also be an, a, a, an in, instrument of sanctification. You know, I'm thinking about how a husband should love his wife as his own body, like in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ of the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's Christ to the church. But in the same way, right, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And so we want to nourish and cherish them. And when they hurt, we want to hurt. And when they're emotionally upset, we want to at least try to understand. We, we want to try to know what's going on with them right now. And, and I fell miserably at that, right? I fell miserably, uh, meaning like there's days I'm feeling like, oh, I, I think I'm getting it, and there's days I'm not. I'm, just, I'm not getting it. You know, I am a dumb man. And I need uh, help, and I need a little grace, but I also need to make sure I'm doing my job instead of getting frustrated. You've got to ask questions that would draw her out to understand what's going on at that moment. I remember Rick used to tell this story. Sorry, we keep telling all these Rick stories, but he used to tell the story that when he was in Michigan, he was riding down the freeway with his wife, and he was the youth pastor, and things were going really well in the ministry, and he was just kept talking about how, man, I'm just like, well, this guy, this guy just came to the Lord. I'm so blessed to be here. I feel like I'm really, you know, God's just blessing what's going on. And, and he looks over at his wife, Kim, and he just sees like a tear coming down her cheek while he's talking. So at first he's thinking like, oh, she's like rejoicing with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's going so well, you know, he's like, oh, it's so sweet. And she's like, he's crying a little bit more. And so he's like, uh oh. So he pulls off the freeway and he's like, honey, Kim, what's the matter? And she said, well, do you think if I called your secretary and booked an appointment that you would disciple me? <laughs> and I said, he was like, uh. <laughs> Like, we, we got to just realize that God's called us to really know them in the present, right? What's going on? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? How can you be a loving husband? And part of that is really knowing her. That's what we're talking about in this first point. Do you really know her? Things that she's experienced in the past, things that she's going through in the present? Or how about number three? You need to know that your wife will change in the future. She will. She will change in the future. You need to know and understand her today. But you need to understand that that might be different tomorrow. And that's okay. That's part of what makes it adventurous to be a part of your marriage to somebody. You know, guys are just always predictable. I mean, every single year for the first five years of my marriage, I buy on Valentine's Day my wife the same gift. And I'm thinking I'm being like an awesome husband, super romantic. What did I get her? A rose from the grocery store. A rose and a card and a box of chocolates, especially if it was on sale or just <laughs> and I'm thinking I'm being super romantic. I'm like, hey, baby, happy Valentine's Day. And it's like the rose in my mouth. You know, you know or, or, and here's a box of chocolate. And so I thought that was really cute. But she, after five years, was like, can't you get a little bit more creative? And I'm like, what? And she's like, every year you buy me the same thing. It's a rose. And I know you picked it up at Walmart. And a box of chocolates and a card. And she's like, I am sick of flowers and chocolates from Walmart. In fact, I don't want you to ever get me flowers and chocolate. And I'm like, okay, all right, well, calm down, honey. I still love you. You know, she's like, I need you to be more creative. And I'm like, all right, done. So, like, for the next five years, I'm trying to find, like, you know, it's already hard enough to do Christmas and anniversary and birthday. But now Valentine's Day, I can't do roses and chocolate anymore. What am I going to do? So, on Valentine's Day, I'm trying to find the right gift for her. And some, some years, I scored big. I mean, I took some notes, and I found out what she wanted, and I got it, and she loved it. And other, other years, I bombed out. I mean, it was a total disaster. You know, I'm like, hey, babe. And she's like, what is this? And I'm like, I got the receipt right here. Honey. <laughs> 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 she, yeah, some gift. I thought she loved it. She hated it. And she looked at me and she says, well, what is this? You know, and, 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 and she said, how come, how come you never get me flowers and chocolate in here? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> Women change, right? And I'm saying that as a husband, you either get frustrated about that, like, you know, what's going on? 
I thought I had it figured out, or you can roll with it. You know, you can just roll with it. You can just like, oh, honey, what are you thinking? I mean, I try to make my wife's coffee every morning. It's just one of the simple ways I can serve her. And she changes her order on me all the time. <laughs> I mean, right when I think I've got her coffee dialed in perfectly, she's like, oh, I don't do oat milk anymore. It's just whole milk. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, honey. You know what I'm saying? I got you. I got you what you want. So now I got all kind of milk in the fridge. I got oat milk. I got rice milk. I got whole milk. I got what, what you want. So when she gets up, I'm like, baby, what you in the mood for this morning? I'm your personal barista. <laughs> Today, you know, because it's, it's like it can be a lot more fun when you are just like thinking of like, I don't know what the day holds. I honestly don't. I've been married 20 years and I still can't figure her out every day. But you know what? I'm learning that this is a joy and a privilege. She's not boring like me. I'm the same every day. She's adventurous. And I'm telling you, we need to embrace that. And we need to be considerate and understanding that continuing to gain that new information, make that your life quest, make that part of who you are. Be an ongoing romantic. Stop thinking that you got it all figured out. You don't know. So you got to ask her. And you got to do so kindly because you can be a little snarky in the way you do it. Like, honey, what do you want today? You know, or you can be really kind about like, hey, babe, what kind of cup of coffee are you in the mood for? You know, it all is about your tone. It's all about how loving you're doing and doing that. And, um, you know, we got to ask our wives and, and, and meet them where they're at. You know, I told you the story about Kim telling Rick, can I make a meeting with you and disciple you? My wife hasn't said that, but she sets himself close to that over the years. I know uh, just, just a year or two ago, she's like, well, honey, we don't pray together anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? We pray together every night. As we go to bed, we pray. Sometimes I fall asleep in the prayer, sometimes I don't. But we, I'm like, and she's like, oh, that don't count. I'm like, why not? She's like, because it's late at night. We're in the bed. We're like exhausted in your prayers are sound kind of monotonous. And, uh, and I'm like, well, what do you want to do about it, babe? She's like, let's, I'm, I'm like, why don't we just pray in the morning? So this year, this is just for us. This year, we get up early. I mean, I'm already up early, but we're getting up early. And we get on our knees at the foot of our bed on most mornings and just pray and ask God to help us. Because you know what? We need his help. We have marriage problems, too. Right? We, we, we go through ups and downs as well. But we're asking God for help. And I'm just thankful I have a wife who wants to lean into that. You know, a, a wife who keeps me on my toes. A wife who communicates, and I'm just saying, that can either turn into like arguments where you push back and fight against that, or you can just embrace it and be like, honey, I got so much to learn. So thankful that you're interested in doing this together. It's talking about living with her again in an understanding way. Let's move on, number two. The second way to live with your wife in an understanding way would be number two, you must see her weakness as an opportunity for chivalry, not mockery. Chivalry is C-H-I-V-A-L-R-Y. I know that's not a biblical word, but I want to explain what I'm talking about here. See her weakness as an opportunity for chivalry, not mockery. We're talking about showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Let's just start with that. What, what in the world does this phrase mean the weaker vessel. What does that mean? What does weaker vessel refer to? That's your next point. What does weaker vessel refer to? Well, there's a lot, a lot of ink spilled, a lot of commentaries trying to explain what this might be talking about when it says the weaker vessel. Believe it or not, some say, number one, your next point, some say that weaker vessel refers to intellectual capacity. Now, right? <laughs> guys who say that obviously probably aren't married <laughs> or they used to be married <laughs> but that's what some say it's one possibility is intellectual capacity we know that's not true I appreciate the fact you guys started laughing as soon as I said it because that's ridiculous right women are smart you know I've worked in the medical field I work with women surgeons at times you know who were brilliant and you know at work that there, there are, are some women that you work with and you're like man that woman's way smarter than I'll ever be and if you don't work with a woman like that, she's smarter in other ways. You know, she can cook a roast and you can't. You know, she can do all kinds of stuff. She can get a stain out of your shirt. You have no idea how to do that. So they're, they're smart in different ways, whether it's a professional type of training or it's just in, in what she does well. So it's certainly not talking about that. It's not talking about intellectual capacity. Number two, some people say, well, maybe it means emotional stability. Maybe it means emotional stability. 
you know, since one, some, some women, you know, get emotional rather quickly, are they really stable? That can be a question, and, and um, you know, sometimes we think about this, like we might go to a dinner party, hanging out with the guys, you know, and it's like we're talking about the barbecue, or we're talking about the Dodgers, and we're talking about whatever, just guy stuff, you know, it's just a total social event, and then we get in the car, they head home, and my wife said, oh, how'd it go with the guys? And I'm like, oh, honey, it went good. And she said, what'd you guys talk about? Well, honey, we talked about the barbecue. Wasn't it really good tonight? She's like, yeah. And, and, you know, what else did y'all talk about? Well, we talked about the Dodgers. Did you know they're they're first in the in their in their league right now? She's like, okay. What else did we talk about? Did you know? Did Jimmy tell you he lost his job? No, Jimmy didn't tell me that. You know, <laughs> did, did this other person tell you his kids having a really hard time? No, he didn't tell me that. And I'm like, what'd you talk about? She's like, oh. And then she goes, oh, no, no, we talked about this, and we talked about that, and we started crying together, and we all laid hands and just prayed for her right there. Now, tell me, in a situation like that, which, 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 which emotional capacity might have been stronger? You know, the guys tend to be the strong, silent type, and they grunt and talk about food and sports. And the women are sitting there talking about real life, <coughs> connecting, and so what? They did cry together. At least they're connecting together in a special way. So I wouldn't say that women are weaker emotionally. They're just different. If I you can make the argument maybe they're stronger than us because they're getting in touch with their feminine side. And we're not willing to. Again, we don't want to be effeminate, right? Uh, but the idea is it's not talking about that. I don't think this has anything to do with emotional stability. A third question is, is it talking about number three, spiritual maturity? That's simply not the case. We've already established the fact we're created equal before God. Yet some people would say that men are stronger spiritually. And they'll take that from the fact that, you know, that God's referred to in the masculine pronouns. Jesus was a man. All, all the apostles were men. First deacons in Acts 6 were men. All the authors of the Bible are men. You know, so you start thinking like, okay, there's a lot of masculinity in the Bible for sure. But think of all the godly women in the Bible as well, right? There's Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Rahab and Deborah and Ruth and Abigail and Elizabeth and Mary, Anna, Priscilla, Lydia. A lot of godly women in the Bible, right? So we just have different roles and responsibilities. There's no male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus, according to Galatians 3.28, right? There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus. Just saying the ultimate identity is we are created in the image of God for his glory. And that's true of men and women. So the word weaker here has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. Okay? Number three, physical strength or four. Excuse me, number four, and this is where I'm putting my cards on the table here, is that this is pretty clear in my opinion that this reference, weaker vessel, is simply referring to physical strength. In fact, the word um, weaker vessel uh, could be translated here as in other passages it clearly refers to the body to the body um, you have you have Romans 9 21 has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lot one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable so vessel is just a clay pot 2 Corinthians 4 7 but we have this treasure in jars of clay so again, a reference to our body, our earthen vessels. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.4, 4, same word is used. 1 Thess 4.4, 4, that each one of you know how to honor and control his own body in holiness and honor. So I think when it says the weaker vessel, it's just about their weaker body. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the fact that God created men with more muscle cells per capita than women. It's a fact, right? And that's okay. That's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's, why, that's why I like it when my wife says, hey, honey, can you open this pickle jar? I'm like, baby, I got that. Give it to me. I am! There you go. You know, there's something about being stronger that glorifies God. And if that's not you in your marriage, if your wife happens to be stronger than you, because I've seen a few marriages where the woman's stronger than the dad, then we'll pray for you. No. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, in general, right, men are stronger than women. And that's a good thing. That gives us an opportunity to be a protector, right? A protector. I mean, I, I think that it, it means that we're able to know that if there's a bump in the night, who gets out of bed? You do. 
Right? You're not like, hey, honey, can you go check on that? <laughs> no, you're like, hey, baby, I got this. Stay right here. You get out of bed. You grab your baseball bat. You head down the stairs, and you're really ready to do business. That's what you're called to do. Which one's better? Well, it's not about better or worse. We're just different. So the weaker vessel concept here is not trying to describe some innate weakness in women. It's just they're physically weaker, which gives us an opportunity to be chivalrous. In fact, just to illustrate this, I've got a couple of... I have a cracked rib, by the way. My son cracked my rib playing basketball last week. So that really hurt. <laughs> Alright, so just to illustrate this a little bit, let's say that this is the man mug. It's the Jersey Shore. Is that a manly place? Alright, hopefully it's not. Is there a show like Jersey something? Alright, anyway. Let's say this mug is a man mug and it represents men. All right, So it's bigger, it's stronger. Let's say it's even one of those things made out of stainless steel. And if you took that mug and you threw it against the ground, what's going to happen? It's going to bounce if it was the stainless steel mug. It's going to bounce. Just think of that big manly mug. So it, it helps you drink coffee. It's a, it's a manly thing and it's your favorite mug. It's a man mug. Then let's say that this represents women and let's say it's the dainty teacup. Okay. So it's the fine china, it's more delicate, um, it's, it's something that's more precious, you pull it out on special occasions, maybe it's Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, you know, what, what are you going to set the table with? A bunch of man bugs around the table, or are you going to put out the teacups? Which one? Probably the teacups, right? It's the fine china. So is one better than the other? No. Is they both have good uses. This is a man mug. It's a little bit more durable, but this is precious in the sight of God. According to 1 Peter, describes that role of women as being precious in the previous verses. It's precious in the sight of God. So don't ever think somehow when he's saying in verse 7 that women are the weaker vessel, that somehow that God's trying to say, oh, yeah, women, that's just weak sauce. You know, that's, that's not true. God values women, and he values men. We're equal, we're just different. So I want to make sure you keep that in mind. So the opportunity then with that difference would, would be then that you have an opportunity in that difference to show her your next blank there, to show her honor as the weaker vessel. The word honor is connected with weaker vessel. The verse is saying here that husbands ought to be, you know, husbands ought to be able to show honor in that. To honor them means that you value them, that you regard them and their personhood as being precious. It means that you prize them as a priceless treasure. To honor them is loving them. Honoring your wife is not just something you say, it's something that you do. You show honor to her, right? Some simple ways you could do that, number one, to supply your wife with the conveniences of life. Supply your wife with the conveniences of life. I'm talking about a well-working dishwasher, washing machine, blender, light bulbs, curling. I mean, women are expensive. That's okay. Right? You take care of them and you honor them. And those are not birthday presents, by the way. Those are just simple things you ought to be doing around the house all the time. It's one way to honor her. Number two, to sacrifice time from your work or your hobby to spend time with her. That you would be willing to sacrifice, right, from that game, that hunting trip, that golf outing. I'm not saying you can never do any of those things, but you know how some guys are. They're so into their hobby that they spend almost all their time and resources chasing that instead of sacrificing and saying, honey, I just want to be with you. Yeah, I thought all the guys, yeah, they are, but I'm not going on that trip. I'm with you. This is our weekend to get, to get together, you know. Number three, to serve her around the house in ways that make life easier. To serve your wife around the house in ways that make life easier. Where does the Bible say that women are supposed to iron shirts for the men? Where does it say that in the Bible? Where does it say that women are supposed to do the dishes, but guys are supposed to sit on the recliner and watch the game? Where does it say, that? Where does it say women vacuum? Does it say that in your Bible? Women vacuum, men don't? No, it doesn't say anything like that. Now, I get it. Our wives want to honor us, and for the homemakers that they are, they, they see that as their primary responsibility, and, and, I, and I'm for all that. But I'm just saying, as a guy, doesn't mean that you can't get off the couch. I mean, my word, the best thing that was ever invented was you could pause live TV. You know, like third down and ten. And then my wife gets home from Costco. Hey, can you guys help us get the groceries? 
It used to be like, uh, honey, just a minute. Now it's just like, pause. What do you need, baby? I'm here for you. <laughs> I go help her get unpacked, get everything put away. Honey, is there anything else you need? No, I'm good, babe. Okay, you sit down dirt and tin. Play. <laughs> the best invention ever. <laughs> but it's like, we need to serve our wives, right, around the house to help with cooking and cleaning and washing uh, our clothes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a way to be chivalrous, right? Another way to be chivalrous is we're just still here serving your wife around the house is, is to open doors. Right? I feel like we've kind of lost the culture. I mean, I grew up in the South again. Guys always open the doors. This is just more extrapolating on number three. But open, do you open the door for your wife? You'd be shocked how many times my wife and I go out on like a double date and uh, I just, I try to make it my, I mean, I'm from the South. You know, I'm, I'm a true Southern boy, all right? My mom was a Southern belle. Uh, one time we go to church and uh, it's raining and my dad and the three kids, I'm the youngest of three kids, we kind of run in to try to, you know, avert the rain. And we get in and, and we're kind of getting the rain off of us. And, and uh, we look around and my mom's still sitting in the car. And my dad's like, oh, guys, hold on, I'll be right back. He goes out to the car, you know, puts the umbrella, opens the door. She, like, puts her hand in his hand. You know, he walks her in, you know. And I just remember, like, she's like a proper lady. Like, it wasn't like she was being snooty about it, but she was going to wait until her man brought her man through the rain. And I just, I just remember, that's how you treat a woman, right? You're kind, you're not making fun of them. You're not dissing on them. You're honoring that weakness, that opportunity for you to serve them in ways. And I'm just saying, guys, don't be so, I was going to say, so when we go on double dates, I'm like, I'm always opening the door for my wife. You know, like, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying it's just something that we do. So we go on a double date and uh, I'll go open the door for my wife. And what do you think the other wife says? Oh, well, Adam opens the door for his wife. <laughs> so now I gotta tell the guys ahead of time. I'm texting, hey, dude, open the door. For his wife. So you look like a chump. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Thanks a lot, Adam. You know. All right. So I'm just saying, in general, don't be so stinking selfish, right? Get up off the couch. Turn off the TV. Take out the trash. Do some laundry. Make the bed. Give the kids a bath. Put on their PJs, read them the Bible, tuck them in bed. You know, you can do these things as a dad. Your wife is doing enough of that, right? And so these are just ways that we can honor our wife. Another way, and moving on now, number four, another way to honor them is to speak kind words to build her up into the woman God's called her to be. To speak kind words, you know, Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. But only that which is helpful for building others up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That's to be practiced first off between a husband and wife. And we're going to actually talk about uh, biblical communication tonight, how, how that we can work and grow in that area. Number five, to save up, to save up, to take her on dates and to buy her gifts and to go on vacation. Uh, you know, sometimes a wife also is mindful of the budget and can feel like, hey, we don't have enough money. No, you say, baby, we got plenty of money for this. And you just tell us, I think we've been saving up. We have a whole account for us to be able to go on dates, to go on an anniversary trip. So she doesn't feel bad, like, oh, it's costing a lot of money. I don't know if we can afford it. No, baby, you, you're worth it. And we've been investing. This isn't costing us a cent. We got money waiting for us to use in this area so they, they don't feel like you're, you know, obligated. It's just a way to celebrate and enjoy time together. So, number three, let's move on. The third way that you can sh that you can um, you know live with your wife in an understanding way, you must share all of life together as co-heirs with Christ. You must share all of life together as co-heirs with Christ. Again, I'm looking at the end of verse seven now that talks about living with her in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Just focusing on that for a minute. They are co-heirs with Christ, right? Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Titus 3, 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So the Bible talks a lot about how we're heirs. And here in 1 Peter 3, 7, it's like we're co-heirs. We share that inheritance equally. Husbands and wives should be the greatest companions on earth. They, they live together and they eat together and they live all of life together. And so why should a husband show honor and sacrifice to his wife? Because they're fellow heirs. 
of the grace of life. Husband and wife, they share life together. Some people say the phrase grace of life just refers to life itself, but I think that it refers to it's a gift. You're co-heirs of the grace of life. This life, it's not talking about here eternal life because you're not married in eternity, right? So it's in this life, they're co-heirs of part of the grace of life. Now, if you're single, you have a gift as well. It's called singleness, 1 Corinthians 7. So you live in itself and use that gift for the glory of God. If you're married, your gift is your spouse. So you use that gift and appreciate that gift to the glory of God and how you interact and honor that gift. Like, like I don't deserve my wife. She's the co-heir of the grace of life. Grace is a gift. God gave my wife to me. I didn't earn her. I don't deserve her. She's a total gift from God. And the best way I can share in the grace of life with her is to share in the grace of God with her. And just to experience Christ together. And to love her like Christ loved the church. And, 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 to, and to be able to, to function. Here's your next blank. How can you function as a fellow heir of the grace of life? How can you function as a fellow heir of the grace of life? Well, number one, listen to your wife and provide for her. We won't go into depth and in all this, but listen to your wife and provide for her. I love the story of John 2, where Mary comes up to Jesus at the wedding in Cana, where they ran out of wine. Remember this? And Mary comes up to Jesus and said, they have no more wine. And he says to her, woman, what does that got to do with me? Now again, in our vernacular, it sounds like he's being rude. In the original, there's not a hint of rudeness. He just simply, he's just simply addressing her question. And then he's going to model how he, as the God-man, and as the miraculous miracle worker, is going to do what he wants in the way he wants, in a way that demonstrates uh, one of the seven miracles that he does in, in John, one of the wonders that he does. And, but I like how it's kind of like he listens to what Mary has to say, and then he, he fulfills that request in his own way. And I think sometimes in marriage, it's like, look, we need to listen to what our wives are saying. Maybe in that moment, you're not going to do exactly what she's asking, but you're like, hey, honey, let me think about that. Why don't we pray about that, and let's come to a decision together, but I want to listen to what you're saying. I know early on in my marriage, we had set a budget about how much money we could spend um, on personal items or like, uh, like clothing, or for me, it might be tickets to a game or something like that. So we had set our budget was 25 bucks. That's all we have. 25 bucks. She could spend however she wanted. I had 25 bucks. I could spend however we wanted a month. And we thought that was that's pretty good. You know, if you really want something, you save up for three or four months. Now you got 100 bucks, so you could go buy something kind of nice. And so, in the middle of this season of uh, 25 dollars a month, I'm in my office at church studying for my best youth pastor sermon ever. You know, and I'm preparing my message. Lisa calls me on the phone and she said, "Hey, honey." What you doing? I'm like, I'm just in the word, babe. You know, and uh, I say, what are you doing? She's like, I'm taking a walk around the block. There's this garage sale, and there's this pottery barn table for sale at this garage sale. Pottery barn, like a nice, uh, you know, uh, furniture shop of decorative items. You know what I'm talking about? The pottery barn. Yeah. So, so my wife says, it's like her favorite store, and she's like, there's this pottery barn table, and I was like, well, how, how much is it? She's like, honey, it's like 200 bucks. I'm like, well, hold on just a second, because she's like, can we get it? Can we get it? Please, 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 can we get this pottery barn table? You know, I'm like, let me check. So I, you know, I just got from the online banking stuff on the computer, again, early 2000s, mid 2000s, whatever, and I, and I'm like checking out our bank account and uh, checking out our budget for the month, and I'm like, honey, I'm sorry, we can't do it. She's like, what? <laughs> you already spent your 25 bucks. You can't have my 25 bucks. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> This is what I'm like, we just can't do it. And she's like, are you serious? And I'm like, honey, we committed to stick to a budget, to give off our first fruits to the Lord, to not go into credit card debt, and we just can't do it. If God wants us to have a body bar and table, he'll provide another way at another time. And she's like, oh, okay, honey. I love you. And I'm like, I love you too, honey. We hang up, and I feel like, well, I look pretty good. <laughs> that was a big test earlier in our marriage. You know, are we sticking to our principles or not? Am I just going to cave and say, yeah, honey, you can get whatever you want. You know, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. And to get back to my study, she calls back like five minutes later, and she says, we got the table. And I'm like, we got what? <laughs> and she's like, your mom got it for us. 
I didn't tell you, but my mom was there that particular day, and she heard our conversation. She said, hey, let me get this for you guys. I wrote a check for the 200, and then my wife was like, I got you. Because <laughs> she knew. I was going to be like, honey, I think I'm going to come home. We're going to talk this out. Because it wouldn't have been right, right? It wouldn't have been right in that setting, but I'm saying that we need to listen and provide for our wife to where maybe in that moment, the problem's not solved exactly the way we wanted to, but at some point we're listening and we want to do what would bring God glory. Another way you can function as a fellow heir of the grace of life, number two, forgive your wife and cover her sin. Forgive your wife and cover her sin. This is the story here in John about the woman caught in the act of adultery, right? And, and they want to stone her. And Jesus is saying to them, let him who is without sin throw the first stone at her. And I know there's all kinds of questions around this particular text, but I'm just saying that the idea here is, do you love your wife enough to forgive her, or are you the, the Pharisee who wants to just throw stones at her? You know, the only one that could have thrown stones at this wife, or this woman, excuse me, caught in adultery, would have been the Lord. But in that moment, he chose to sow mercy, right? He said, who is, who, who, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you, and from now on, sin no more. Again, I just like the way with Jesus treats women all throughout the Bible. He's kind and respectful to his mom. He's gracious with this woman. He, he's never plowing over some woman in some rude, ridiculous way. And I think there's a lot we can learn from that, that we're, we're, we're going to work through forgiveness and, and grace and let love cover in certain situations. How about this one? Number three, empathize with your wife and honor her emotions. Empathize with your wife and honor her emotions. You want to take another page from Jesus' book? Well, how about when he shows up to the graveside of Lazarus in John 11, and you know that Lazarus has been dead, and Mary and Martha, what do they think about it when Jesus finally shows up? Remember, they told him about it. He's not well, and he said, let's wait two more days. Then he shows up. Now we're on day four, where the King James says, he stinketh. Right, Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. And, and how did Mary and Martha feel about the fact that Jesus showed up a little bit later than when they originally sent for him? They're, they're, they try to tell him what they think about it. Like, Lord, if you'd have been here. I mean, they're, they're venting a little bit of frustration. I think they're also venting faith. But we know that whenever you ask, God will grant to you. So there's, there's some spiritual maturity. But they're also just having an honest conversation. If you would have been here and in the middle of all that, what do you have? You got the shortest verse in the Bible, where in John 11, you know, 35, it says Jesus wept. Ever thought about that? He wept. Now think about it. He already knew I'm coming. I'm showing up late on purpose. I'm going to raise a body from the grave on day four, but that's never been done before, and that body's fully set in to decomposing and rigor mortis. It's going to be an outstanding miracle. I'm going to teach. Everybody, I am the resurrection and the life. He already had his game plan. He knows exactly what he's going to do. But what does he do with Mary and Martha? He connects with them emotionally. And he wept. And I just think about that example when I think about when my wife is maybe in a weaker moment emotionally, and she's distraught, or she's anxious, or she's fearful. My temptation is to typically say, Honey, why do you let that bother you? That's fear of man. You don't need to be having fear of man. You need fear of God. What's wrong with you, woman? That's my tendency, right? To just like, you know, bam, bam. And I'm learning to be like, you know what? It's okay to feel the way you feel in this moment. It's a hard day. It's a difficult situation. I'm not embracing sin, but I'm just saying, I understand that emotionally right now, it, this is a tough moment. And instead of me just coming in to begin to be the biblical counselor by instructing and admonishing her, which I think there's a time and place for that, but in this situation, Jesus is emoting with these women. He's weeping with them. And I just think that a husband could go a long way to honor that emotion and that, that, that frailty when you see it. And instead of just dictating to them what they should be doing, you want to enter into that with them. That's really hard. You know, but it's exactly what Jesus models for us, and I think it's a place that we can all grow in. The way to live with her is the co-heir of the grace of life. Next blank. What happens if you don't live with your wife in an understanding way? If you choose not to do this, what does the end of verse 7 say? It says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. 
What happens if you don't live with her? Number one, your prayers will be hindered. The word hindered here is a military term that means to cut in on, throw obstacles in the way of, or to cut up the road. Kind of like, kind of like you're going to blockade that, that channel of passage for a military so they can't advance. And so it's, all, it's like God saying, look, I don't want you to come and pray to me if you're not doing what I've told you to do with your wife. So you're going to come pray to me for that promotion at work, or you're going to pray to me for whatever you want God to do in your life. And he's like, yeah, but you're not doing what I've already told you to do by loving your wife, uh, you know, like Christ of the church, Ephesians 5, living with her in an understanding way. In this passage, 1 Peter 7, it's almost like God saying, I don't want to hear your prayers until you do what I've told you to do. In other words, you're not being obedient. He answers the heart of a man who's obedient. Right? That, that's what he's going to answer those prayers. And when we're living in sin, God is saying, I, I don't want to hear it right now. This is Psalm 66, verse 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would have not listened. So when we have sin in our heart, he doesn't listen to those prayers. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear so I'm just saying that if you want God's blessing in your marriage, he expects us to walk in obedience in these ways. And so again, if we don't live with our wife in an understanding way, our prayers are hindered. And number two, the gospel will not be put on display. The gospel will not be put on display. Remember, marriage is supposed to be a picture of Christ and his love for the church. And you're to be compared to Christ loving the church, and she's compared to the church. We understand there's other places where we're the church. Jesus is, is the bridegroom, and, and we're, we're, the, we're the bride. Uh, but here, the gospel is placed on display in how you live your marriage. I think that one of the best ways for you as a couple to reach this culture is to have a marriage that honors God. And with all the divorces that are going on and all the problems you hear about other people complaining about their marriage at work, and they're complaining about their marriage in your family. And they're dissing on each other and making sly comments, you know, condescending their spouse. That if you were to step up and say, I'm so thankful for my wife. I don't deserve her. I'm learning how to live with her in a God-honoring way. It causes people to stop. I mean, can you imagine some, some, somebody coming up to a wife and the wife is submitting to her husband and the other one was like, why do you do that? You don't have to submit to him. And if a wife were to say, it's my joy and honor to submit to my husband as unto the Lord because he loves me and he cherishes me. What do you think that unsaved friend is going to say? They're going to be like, man, what are you even talking about? And then you just jump right in. We're talking about the gospel. The gospel saved us. And not only did the gospel save us, it's revolutionized our marriage. And as we live in our marital connections in a way that, that honors the Lord, people see the gospel on display. It's a powerful witness, particularly in our culture today, about showing others Christ and how you relate in your marriage. And so what's the take home for this session? Just a couple of things to think about practically. Number one is learning about your wife and discovering new things about her. A joy for you or a drudgery. Is it a joy for you to listen carefully and learn new things about your wife? Or do you count it to be a drudgery? I mean, I think if we're to be honest, sometimes we just get tired of hearing a lot of things and we get frustrated. And I, I would hope and pray it would become a joy. I'm thinking about my dad. I told you I, we buried my dad um, recently. And he uh, was not a perfect husband, but I'm telling you, he loved my mom. And I remember, for some reason, I remember looking through his calendar. And in his calendar, he would have the stuff, you know, at work and family and church, whatever. And then it, it, as I flipped through his calendar, I was a kid, just flipping through it just like mindlessly. And I would notice that there was a period, like this literal period, uh, like every time I flipped to a new month, there would be a period. <laughs> so I asked my dad, my dad, I'm like, Dad, what is this period? And he's like, well, that's your mom's period. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what is that? He's like, I'll tell you later. But <laughs> once a month, she goes through a little bit of a challenging week. And I have that on my calendar, so I know that during that week, I'm going to be extra gracious. And I'm going to be extra kind. And I'm going to try to do my very best to honor her in that week. And you know how many times I've thought about that through my life? Is that like, like you know, why is marriage so hard right now? It could be something that simple. That maybe your wife is going through that time of the month, and she's just a little bit raw in her emotions. Instead of being like frustrated about it, 
It's like, oh, oh, honey, let me let me take care of that. Let me serve you. That you don't have to talk about it in some weird way, but you can just be aware so that you can love her and show a little extra grace in that month. And I'm just saying, it ought to be a joy for us to learn, not a drudgery. Number two is being chivalrous more about you and your armor or about your wife and showing her honor. Right? We talk about that idea of chivalry. It's really not about you being the white, shiny knight, you know, looking all buff in your armor. It's about like, no, I've got to get off of my horse. And I want to get down and serve this lady. We we're we're, we're, we're have an opportunity to, to help her out as the weaker vessel. That's my job as a godly husband. And then last is the gospel magnified that we were just talking about. Is it magnified in how you share life with your wife, or is it tarnished because of your lack of grace? Is it magnified, or is it tarnished? And if you're here today, I hope that you'll take to heart just some of the simple, uh, clear principles that we've seen in this version. As we go to small group, that you would just be open and honest to say, hey guys, I'm really struggling. Would you pray for me? But here's one thing I could do with the Lord's help to learn how to live with my wife in an understanding way. Let me pray for you that you would be able to do just that. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about this passage and this one verse and its context in 1 Peter. Lord, you know I struggle. I'm happily married, but I struggle at times with my own pride and my own impatience. In, in my own thinking, I, I got it all together, and I, and I, and I fell miserably. And, uh, and I'm just thankful for your grace in my life, and your grace in our marriage, and, and the opportunities Lisa and I have to, 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 to seek you together. And, and I just pray for that husband who's here today. Maybe, maybe he's in a great season right now where you're just blessing his marriage immensely, and he's in love more than he's ever been. And we just want to give you thanks for that. There's certainly seasons like that for all of us, God. And I just pray that you would continue that. And, and I pray for that husband who's here today, and he's just struggling. He's just saying, be honest with you, we're in a real bad place right now. We've been fighting, like, all the time. There's times I haven't even asked forgiveness, and we've let the sun go down on our anger, and I've, and, I've, and I've just been so frustrated. I don't understand what's going on. Would you help, would you help that husband right now see that the problem's him, that it's his own pride and his own impatience, that you would bring conviction with that conviction, God, that you would bring confession with that husband, whether it be me or one of the other men here, could say, God, please forgive me for not living out the principles of this verse. God, help me. I need your help. Thank you for giving me a manual, both in her heart. I want to draw it out and in your word, objectively. I want to learn and study these passages a little bit more deeply and ponder how could I apply these in my own situation. I pray for that young man who's single. Right now, who's scared to death right now of getting married. <laughs> I pray God that you would just help that young man realize that marriage is a beautiful blessing, but it's a lot of hard work, and that's okay. Anything worth having is can be hard work. God, I just pray you help that young man just have open eyes to realize that there's a lot he could do to prepare committing his heart to your word to be that kind of husband that we all strive to be. Thank you for the perfect example in the ultimate bridegroom, the person of Jesus, who comes back for his church, and that he washes us and cleanses us and sanctifies us, that he might return for the church that is, that is without spot or wrinkle. And we're just thankful for the grace of God through Christ that saves us and helps us learn how to live with our wives in an <clears throat> understanding way. Would you do a special work of grace in each heart, particularly as we discuss these things more openly and transparently with one another, that you would receive all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And as we get home, God, there would be significant changes. Maybe just one, but something significant that would change in the way that we relate to our wife and the way that we could truly show them honor. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.